The 1968 ill-fated Penn Central merger was between the New York Central and the Pennsylvania Railroads. This is one chapter of a long two-hour and 20-minute DVD video on the failure of the Penn Central and the forming of Conrail to rescue what amounted to a large number of bankrupt Eastern Railroads into a successful enterprise. You are looking at a remarkable and yet lost railroad. It wasn't around for that long in railroad terms. It was created out of a heap of economic ash with the intent that it would become a healthy enterprise and then be terminated. Conrail saved the Northeastern Railroad industry from a mass extinction event. This included its constituent parts and the smaller independent roads orbiting around it. It operated from 1976 to 1999 when it was then split up into two pieces. Norfolk Southern and CSX each received large sections of the former Conrail. The Conrail story begins with the failure of the bankrupt Penn Central Railroad. The Penn Central merger was approved in 1968 by merging the New York Central and the Pennsylvania Railroads. The two roads announced plans to merge in 1960. Back then, it wasn't unusual for the Interstate Commerce Commission, or ICC, to take a number of years to approve any merger. Some mergers in the U.S. took so long to be approved that at least one of the merger partners sank into such bad shape waiting that the other road lost all interest. You would think that after waiting for eight years, the Penn Central had had time to plan a smooth merger while waiting for the approval. The New York Central and the Pennsylvania Railroad, both heavyweights in eastern railroading, were still fairly healthy back in 1968, but their operating styles were difficult to blend. There was infighting between the New York Central and the Pennsylvania Railroad staffs that had been merged together. They referred to each staff group as the Red Team for the Pennsylvania Railroad and the Green Team for the New York Central. That was a prescription for problems and cooperation. It's hard to have two teams within a team. The Penn Central merger was created to end the competition of the two roads and strip out the duplicate trackage to create an efficient carrier. Instead, the merger of two equals brought the competition inside the new railroad. Penn Central declared itself bankrupt by June 21, 1970. Freight car loads that weren't damaged by derailments were often lost in the system from differing paperwork methods and computer systems that were not compatible for sharing data. Generations of accumulated work rule agreements in the various trades and crafts had been thrown together in the Penn Central merger. It made life difficult for both workers and managers. If the Northeast fell, the entire U.S. railroad industry could soon go with it. Even the Western shippers using healthy Western roads would wonder how their goods would ever get to the East if the handoff couldn't be made. Shipments were frequently delayed, sometimes lost or damaged in derailments from poor track conditions. This is the original 1975 USRA plan for the Conrail system. Not shown is the bankrupt Erie Lackawanna Railroad and its 2,800 miles of track that was also tossed into the new Conrail. Track upkeep was a patchwork due to lack of funds. The effects of bad track would reduce earning capacity. The result was more maintenance deferral, taking the whole system into a death spiral, beyond the point of no return. An 
aftershock was the Lehigh Valley declaring bankruptcy three days after Penn Central. This eerie Lackawanna-powered Conrail train came out of Croxton Yard. Erie Lackawanna was wrecked by Hurricane Agnes in 1972. It was from an earlier merger of Erie and the smaller Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western. These two had already worked in cooperation to reduce duplicate trackage since the 1950s. In 1976, the U.S. government placed the huge, bankrupt Penn Central system, along with other regional bankrupt roads, into a basket called Consolidated Rail Corporation. It looked like a reform school for bad railroads. In short, everyone called it Conrail. It was an emergency creation as a government-funded private company. They sprinkled a few billion dollars on this concoction and gave the new Conrail solution an April 1st, 1976 birthday. Conrail became the largest U.S. railroad at the time with a total of 34,000 miles of track. Few gave Conrail much of a chance. The April 1st start date seemed unnerving. The trailing red, white, and blue SD-45 was a former Erie Lackawanna Bicentennial Unit, formerly number 3632. This chart shows the forming of Conrail. On the top is the New York Central and Pensy that formed Penn Central. The New Haven was tossed into this group as well. This group went into Conrail with the large roads of the Reading, the Lehigh Valley, Erie Lackawanna, and the Central Railroad of New Jersey. A few smaller lines not shown followed into the fray. The Lehigh Valley Railroad trackage shown here became part of Conrail. The DNH was given former Lehigh Valley diesels and granted trackage rights on the Lehigh Valley line to give Conrail some competition and shippers another choice of service. Fourth back is a Central New Jersey GP7. The Central Railroad of New Jersey fell into Conrail as it had been bankrupt since 1967.
can see from these early Conrail scenes that the track was in bad shape, needing all the renewal possible. Conrail spent years working on that. Earlier derailments had plagued the Penn Central. Trains derailing on the main line were one thing, but derailments were occurring even at walking speed in freight classification yards. The first diesel painted in the new Conrail Blue was number 3091, a GP40, shown here as the third unit. Reading units brought 215 diesels to the mix of nearly 5,000 Conrail diesels at the startup. This is the old Reading Railroad route map. The Reading was known as a heavy coal hauler from anthracite country. Early Conrail, you never knew what to expect in power assignments back then. The winter of 1976 and 77 had record snowfall that plagued Conrail's early efforts. Inherited from Penn Central was a collection of about 160 assorted electric locomotives, such as these 4,400 horsepower E44s. All the electric locomotives were retired by 1981.
Conrail had nearly 5,000 locomotives of numerous models from all the merged railroads. They were largely worn out. Locomotives that could still pull a train faced chronic derailments. The track was in terrible shape. Shipping customers were turning to trucks and highways more and more. Many of the lines Conrail inherited were built in earlier times when coal hauling was more important. That business was in serious decline by 1976. Many manufacturing plants had also moved away to the south. All this and more was faced and dealt with. Jordan navigated Conrail's way through the Ford and Carter presidential administrations. The 1980 Staggers Act brought new federal deregulation laws. The Staggers Act by Representative Harley O. Staggers of West Virginia gave the railroads the right to set the rates of hauling freight on their own, and the rules for abandoning unproductive trackage were greatly relaxed. In short, it was deregulation. GP38-2, number 8045, was one of 233 from Penn Central. The last
fast unit 3105 was a GP40, one of 272, also from the Penn Central. Ridgewood was the location on the old Erie Main Line where power had to run around trains to conduct their business, dropping off cars and to also use the Bergen County Line. Conrail turned to leasing and borrowing power such as these Canadian national units. Conrail's inherited locomotives that weren't sold off were rebuilt by the hundreds. Third back is 2501, a 1964 built former New York Central U25B in new Conrail colors.
despite all the renumbering and shuffling around, 2501 had the same number on the New York Central, the Penn Central, and finally, Conrail. Sixty-five twenty on the point is a General Electric 1966 built ex-Pennsylvania Railroad U-28C still wearing its old number but in fresh Conrail blue. numbered to 6820. SD 45, 6133 was inherited from the Pennsylvania Railroad through Penn Central. Conrail gained 174 SD 45s total from Penn Central, Reading, and the Erie Lackawanna. U36B, number 2973, was one of four on Conrail. Conrail bought the four that were diverted from an auto train order at General Electric in Erie, Pennsylvania. Edward Jordan was selected as CEO in 1976 to run the new Conrail solution. Jordan was a former insurance executive. He had no prior experience with railroading. Therefore, he had no preconceived notions or favoritisms to one group or the other, green or red. Jordan was CEO until 1980, during the critical first four years. Revised agreements between labor and management helped tremendously. Jordan's efforts would pay off. The system had been stabilized, even revitalized in many ways, by 1981. On the plus side, long-distance passenger trains had already been passed off to Amtrak since 1971. 
the commuter trains were still Conrail's burden. By January 1, 1983, all commuter equipment, operational and employee costs, were transferred to local and regional transit authorities. This was a huge relief for a road that was just interested in hauling freight to the best of their abilities. These Penn Central FL9s inherited by Conrail were capable of powering trains from either electrical third rail or in non-electrified territory by an internal diesel. There were 56 of them. These were eventually turned over to commuter railroads and off the Conrail roster. You may have noticed several times by now that crews in the front cab frequently toss a paper out the window as they run by. They aren't littering. It's a time-honored practice of giving trackside rail fans a copy of their train orders. This Norfolk and Western powered train is actually a Delaware and Hudson trackage rights train on former Central Railroad of New Jersey tracks, now owned by Conrail. Part of the story was the fate of the Delaware and Hudson, or DNH. The DNH was chosen to give Conrail regional competition. This small road was part of the Norfolk and Western through a subsidiary called Direco at the time, basically a holding company. At one time, even the Norfolk and Western itself was under the corporate shadow of the Pensy. How things can change. With the 1968 Penn Central merger, the DNH looked for a good merger partner. The DNH was financially in fair shape back then. All the possible merger candidates were not. The Erie Lackawanna had given DNH useful connections in the past. When the Erie Lackawanna fell into the Conrail merger, the USRA gave the DNH sizable trackage rights on former Erie lines and former Reading lines. This is a map of the D&H in the Conrail era. The dotted lines indicate trackage rights sections. These trackage rights even extended down to Washington, D.C. No financial help was offered to the D&H. The D&H was very popular for its pleasing blue and gray colors and its passenger train promotion under its president, Frederick Dumaine. A number of Conrail captured locomotives were transferred over to the DNH. The DNH would hang on in one form or another for a time. By 1984, it became part of the Guilford system until bought by the Canadian Pacific later in 1991. The Canadian Pacific would then have service all the way down to Washington, D.C. Be sure to check out our website for railroad videos of the past with history and great historic views.